Well, listen, let me tell you something. I'm, and I'm, again, I made some stupid ass mistakes, you know, as a kid coming up, like we all did. Yeah. I had to live with them. Yeah. I wish I, wish I went to college because I almost went bankrupt three times because I had no financial intelligence. But I was the stupid kid who said, oh, I got out of high school. I'm going to take one year off before I went to college. And that one year became, you know, became the rest of my life. Hi guys, welcome to the Vlad Catcher Show where we interview the most successful founders and entrepreneurs. And our guest today is Damon John from Shark Tank, the CEO co-founder of FUBU. I'm extremely happy to have him here with us. Damon, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So I wanted to just jump right in because I was studying the key points of FUBU, the key trajectories that grew. And I have about 13 points, 13, 14 points of the journey of FUBU. Um, if you could try to walk us through, because this way they'll know the FUBU journey from beginning to $300 million in sales from the key elements. An example of what I mean by key elements, like you started selling hats, sold $800 worth of hats, then the next big moment, right? Yeah. How would you walk us through this journey? Yeah. Um, journey, num uh, idea number one is uh, realizing at 20 years old that I could put my two loves together, hip hop, and fashion yeah. and that was something that I loved ever since I was 10 years old yeah. um, so the, the first concept right there uh, number number two was I have a community that is not being spoken to and somebody's not solving the problem because they're yeah. feeling neglected hmm. and the community wasn't about a color it was about a culture um, because a lot of people thought the food was only for a color but Listen, if I could dress MC Search or even Eminem today, I couldn't care less, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're amazing artists. Uh, all right, that was, that was number two, that there was a need in a market. Mm. Number three was, how do I take an affordable step? Well, I'm gonna make some hats myself. I'm gonna stand on the corner and see if I have uh, proof of concept, as we always ask people in Shark Tank, what are your sales? Yeah. Now that I knew my sales, that was step number three. Number four would be, um, Number four would probably be understanding after proof of sales what my product was and how to maximize my product. Meaning, as a designer, you come out with, uh, you want to come out with 10 colors. Mm -hmm. I had to stand on the corner enough time to find out that 60% of my, the colors sold was black. Yeah. The other 20% was white. So let me cut out eight colors. Mm -hmm. You have 10 logos. I found out they only bought two logos. And yeah. you have, four sizes, they all want a double X. You so you start everything. to get narrow and deep on it, mm. right? Then I needed to let the world know that I had the product and what was my version of influencers at that time? It was rappers, it was the cool kids in the community. So I had to get it onto them. That would then spawn the growth or the identification of the brand. Now I want to take it to a bigger level. I have proof of concept, I have somewhat little level of sales, and I have influential people wearing it. How do I now get this thing to be working all around the world um, in different stores? I go to the trade show and seek out the people who can help me push the product out, meaning retailers, things mm -hmm. of that nature. So I get the retailers behind me. All right, after that, I don't have any funds, so I turn my house into a factory and mortgage my house, and so now I'm making the clothes. The next factor after that would be that I would take an ad in the newspaper to to get funding, and Samsung would, a would answer the ad, Samsung Textile Division would answer the ad. The step after that was now that I had uh, somebody like that behind me, was that I had to, uh, well, I already had sales. I had to then, and I already had, I'd already built an influence of the brand and people who wanted to buy, meaning end consumer and stores. So the step after that, I think, would, was uh, that helped me, and I wasn't in control of this, was LL Cool J in the Gap ad, put mentioning FUBU in the Gap ad. Mm. I saw it. Yeah, that, yeah would, that, awesome. would, that would that would get out there. To, I saw that it, would dude. get out there to the world, um, 
And after that was, all right, well, I can't be every place at the same time. I only know how to make men's clothes. So it was then going on and taking on licensing. I saw licensing things in different, first of all, the United States, different categories, meaning I made men's. I licensed out women, boys, boots, bags, things of that nature. Mm. The next step was licensing inter internationally. I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak Chinese, I don't speak all these areas. I can either go in there and get screwed or how did the influence I built here help me negotiate deals over there that we can then nurture relationships and have somebody else who's a specialist in Europe, a mm. specialist in Asia, a specialist in all these territories. So I mean, those are just a couple of the mm. ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Mm. Um, but I know you said you had about 14 or 18 of them. For there. sure, dude. So, so I'm an entrepreneur like you. I don't have as much experience. You have 30 years, right? If you're basically with 30 years experience, I have eight. Um, and I always think about the, the kind of the, the hacky stuff. And for example, I saw the three things you guys did that were very hacky that I don't think people know. Uh, one was you got your uh, jerseys, you said on bodyguards and uh, bodyguards and like- uh, Big guys. Big guys, because that way they wear them, right? And it's like a constant advertisement for you. And you mentioned that they wear 10X more than a guy who will just wear one. Right. So that was very hacky. Uh, another thing you did, you said you painted the doors. The gates. You the painted the gates. The security, gates, security white, gates. White, right? So that yeah. way they put it down. And I thought that was fascinating. And I, I would paint them all, just for clarity. I would, I would go to all the stores in the community and say, um, you know, you pull down the nasty storm because they have graffiti on them. Mm. Is it possible I could put up a beautiful white sign, no profanity, mm. of a local company yeah. that the kids love? And if you do that, now you have only graffiti on your gates right now. We would also know that you really care and support the community, and yeah. in return, we'd support you. And I, I spray painted 300 gates, and I spray paint authorized FUBU dealer awesome. on 300 gates. So mm. when they were pulled down during often morning rush hour in Manhattan, you know, uh, and it's often even a rush hour because of the buses and the trains and the pedestrians, millions of people would see these gates. Yeah. And I would look like those would be what you look, would look at now, billboards. Yeah. That was very hacky though. Yeah. And that's not out there as much, right? Like, so the, the gates is not out there. The the big guys wearing the clothing. LL Cool J was huge for you. And that's because you got the super loyal, uh, you, you found a way to get the super loyal guy to your yeah. company. And there's kind of a side question on this is, so for the founders who are trying to get a super loyal guy like LL for their brand, should they give him like a cut of the equity? What's the best way to execute a deal like this? Well, first of all, you go to the, the big guy influencers. So when you, when you, you know, the story that you were sharing about the big guys, what was that? That means that LL Cool J is and was a huge superstar in my community. Yeah. I couldn't just give LL something I could, but everybody's giving him something. Yeah, yeah. And instead of, I only had money, money for 50 shirts. Instead of giving it to the cool kids who wear it one time and they're cool, they don't wear things two, three times and they would throw it away or give it to somebody else. I realized that the big guys never had fashionable stuff. They yeah. either had a big white shirt or a big black shirt or they were big and they had to make custom apparel for themselves, mm. which cost them a lot. Yeah. So that's why I give it to those guys. And what happened with those guys? Those guys were always in front of the red rope at a club. They were always a bodyguard mm. or they were just a big, joyful guy. And like you said, they would wear 10X because mm. they finally had something good to wear. LL saw that, but he didn't get anything. Yeah. But it was a very familiar logo with LL because he had so many big guys around him. Mm. So when I finally approached LL, there was an already embedded uh, logo yeah. in his mind and some big guy and the cool guys he knew were already in the industry. And he was like, I'm open. You see, I had built influence with yeah. him way prior to ever really approaching him. Mm. And that's what people can do today. You know, I always share with people that you can go after the Kim Kardashians of the world if you want, and you can pay top dollar for them, and they are extremely effective, but they have to match the brand. Yeah. And Kim and uh, the family, they really know what their brand is. But however, if you're paying, let's argument say, I don't know where she's at now, but maybe, let's say, I know she has a little bit less, but let's say 200 million. Mm. Let's say she has 200 million followers, and you want to support her, and, and she wants to support you, and you just want to pay cash and say, listen, I want to pay money first. Mm. It works. Give you a piece of the company or vice versa. Mm. And trust me, I'm sure they want to do the same. Um, and you give them this money for 200 million followers. Let's say it's lipstick. Mm. Well, I always say this. I use this example a lot. 25% of the people that are following her love her. 25% mm. 
love to hate her. So they're never going to buy the lipstick. Yeah. They're going to buy that same color from anybody else except Kim Kardashian, mm -hmm. right? And the other 50% maybe males who just love how beautiful she is or love the story of her and Kanye. Yeah. They're not buying lipstick either. So you've just paid for 25%. Yeah. Right? You paid for 100% yeah. of only 25% what you get. Why do I say that to the founders right now? Because you'd rather get somebody who is, you'd rather get a thousand Kim Kardashians who each have just a thousand followers. Mm. And you want to pay them. Why? Because if they're not a public person and stuff like that, probably 90% of the people following them follow them because they want to follow them and they worship them. Mm. Right? So a lot of people always want to hit this big target up here, but that's not where you start. And even when I see people uh, who say, all right, you got influence right there. But I also see people say, I want to be a Walmart. Mm. Oh, why? I want to be a Walmart. What's your why? Why do you want to be a Walmart? You know, because when you're in Walmart, Walmart is a big company, right? And there's a lot of risk uh, for both Walmart and you. Why aren't you dealing with the specialty stores? Mm. The specialty stores yeah, always so. blew my business up. You know why? Because if I sell to Walmart, when they sell out, or if they sell out, they may reorder, you know, here, there, whatever the case is, or every quarter, whatever the criteria is. When a specialty store, who the proprietor owns the store, and they're making, and they're paying their rent off of every single thing they sell, when they sell out, they're ordering right away. They're also an ambassador. They're also, when you come in the store, hey, they're telling people, this is what really sells really well. You go to Walmart, you got to find somebody yeah, yeah. to, hey, we're, you know... So you got to understand a lot of people like to start here when it's not here they start and it really starts with creating influence first mm. in whatever relationship it is you know yeah you you're just suggesting to them to take the grassroots approach right like find your hundred people who love you instead of the million people who kind of like you yeah grassroots and then eventually you can get the big guys because you did so much grassroots work like you did with hundred percent with the bodyguards and the bigger guys in the community yeah um, is were there any other uh, hacks? I, we, I call these hacks, right? Creative ways to gain customers. Were, th were there any other creative hacks that you did to really j increase demand or sales for FUBU? Plenty. What are some? Like, what are a few more of them? Uh, when we first started out, I think a thirty-second commercial on um, MTV was six thousand hmm. dollars, and a thirty-second commercial on BET was a thousand dollars. Got it. Now that's according to Nielsen ratings, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're able to, like any business we're in, even podcasts, whatever the case is, your numbers reflect how much you can charge. So yeah. let's say, argument's sake, a million people were watching BT uh, MTV's thirty seconds. So that justified asking for six thousand dollars per hour, mm. and BT then. Obviously, the number would be, uh, you know, uh, only 15% of that, mm. right? 150000 But I knew already that nobody in the projects pays for cable. Mm. So, number one, there were way more than a million people watching BET because they had maybe illegal cable. I see. Also, a lot of African Americans are, have big families. And there are more people around one television set. Got it. And at that time, there was not a lot of African-American programming going on. So MTV had programming that everybody could watch. So now you're one of 30 channels, but BET is one of one. Mm. So I paid $1,000. Yeah, I understand. Right? And I bought as many commercials as I could. And I damn near owned the network for two years. Mm. And it became way more profitable than this. Yeah. Another hack was, you know, at the time when they were blurring out logos on um, all the jerseys and all the things because they said, you know, we, we don't want to give free advertising. So even if I brought a product down to a video set, they couldn't wear it or it was a big blur. Mm. This was around 95 or 96. I realized that no jersey out there had had a number 05. And nobody can ever say they were founded in 05 because 05 never came around. So I created and trademarked the 05. It was a number. The networks weren't blurring numbers. So we ended up trademarking 05, and we would then be able to put our jerseys in every single video we had, and nobody would ever look at something as FUBU. They would say 05, but they knew it was FUBU. But yeah. the networks didn't say anything because it's a 0 and a 5. Yeah. What are you going to start blurring out a 1 and a 2 and a, and a Jeter number and a Jordan yeah. number? So a lot of these type of hacks happen uh, very often. I understand.
and that's the way you do it. You did something really cool. Uh, you guys, you had a purchase order, I think, from Las Vegas for three hundred thousand, and then you put an ad in some newspaper to get that money. That's a hack, dude. That's another one of those really, really creative things, right? And that's what Sam Samsung came in from. Right, and I wish I could tell you that I did it because I was a genius, but I did it. I, I got Samsung money because I was an idiot. Um, because I went, I got turned down my 27 banks. I turned my house into a factory. I had a hundred thousand mm. dollars into it, and I didn't know what I didn't know. So I was paying for real goods 90 days ahead of time. I was paying for my staff and shipping and uh, equipment, mm. right? And at that time, you know, of course, you know, accounts receivables, the the, uh, the retailers weren't paying me for 30, 60, 90 days. Cash flow problems, yeah. I was about to lose my house. Yeah. I turned around, had five hundred dollars left. My mother said to me, you got one last chance. Let me just take an ad in the newspaper. I said, we have nothing to lose. Mm. Go ahead. And 33 people called that ad. It was my, ver my mother's version of Kickstarter. Yeah. Now 30 of them were loan sharks, mm -hmm. um, but three of them were real. It was Samsung who yeah. called. Yeah, it is a hack, but I really wish I could tell you that it was foresight. It was not at all. Mm. I love this journey, dude. I'd, I'd still like to kind of, I'd like to touch on kind of, I have like 12, I have 12, we still have time, I have 12 of these uh, points. See if you can correct me if I miss any of it, because that way it's, your, it's a FUBU journey. You had a passion, you realized when you were young, just correct me, just correct me, like if I'm off, you realized when you were young that if you sell clothing with meaning, people are more likely to buy it, right? Kind of before even FUBU, that's one. Then from there you started, you started selling beanies and hats, right? Yes. In the, sh in the street. In the street, so hand in hand. It is, so that way you'll find out right away uh, whether they like it. You, your if sales you have skills, something of value. Yeah, your sales skills also grew a lot, right? From hustling pencils, like you said you did before. Your sales skills grew a lot and you had proof of concept because they were buying it. Yeah. So then you were, um, you were not ready to take the plunge yet and that's why you kept working for five years during this time while you were still probably optimizing right you were optimizing what, what was the key thing you were trying to do during that five years was you we worked on more perfecting the product or what was the key thing you were trying to do during those five so years? you're talking about the five years that i worked at red lobster yeah, well, you were and, still hustling and i thing. had um i was still doing the hats so yeah. i would work an average of 20 hours a day for five years um and the reason i did that is because I wanted to have enough time and I wanted to have enough resources to be able to know that I left everything on the field with the company. Yeah. And if I would have uh, just, if I would have just left everything and le left Red Lobster, then I would have been focused to having to make the company a success in six months where yeah. it was unrealistic. Mm. But if I could put that time in and work at Red Lobster, I made my $30,000 a year. Yeah. I had medical benefits. I was taking all the food home from Red Lobster and eating that. I would tell the Red Lobster other waiters to come to a flea market on the weekend and help me sell goods. It allowed me to make a lot of mistakes on a very small level, but over the course yeah. of five years. I also rented out rooms in my house. So now I'm renting out uh, rooms for whatever, $35 a week. So it's helping me pay down the mm. mortgage um, and and obviously do what I want to do. Um, did I sacrifice a lot? Not really, I'm 20 years old. Yeah. I, I didn't have kids, I didn't have anything else at that time, so I was able to put the work in at that time. I knew I wasn't gonna be able to put that work in later on in my life when I was older with kids and a wife or mm. whatever the case is. So, so that was really one of the things that, you know, and I was, but more importantly for the founders, and this is something every single successful person watching this can agree well upon, I loved what I was doing. Yeah. I just loved it. You know, and that's why the five years didn't feel like any time because first of all, I was and everybody here knows how it feels when you first see somebody with your product or order your service and they, they have the <clears throat> they have this joy in it for what they did and you validate that you have something worth value to them. Yeah. Uh, I love seeing that, right? Uh, so every day I'd wanna make a different kind of hat, a different kind of shirt, whatever the case is, I wanna put it on a different person. Oh my God, I see a person walking down the block with it. I never thought about wearing it like that. That's cool. Yeah. Right? They're interpreting it a different way, right? So that's why I could do it on the five years. So mm -hmm. if anybody right here is watching saying, Jesus Christ, you think I gotta put five years into this crap that I'm doing? Then you shouldn't be doing it because you hate what you're doing. Sure. You're doing it for the wrong reason. For sure. And after you worked for five years, had some stability, had more sales, eventually left, took the, took the, uh, went to the uh, uh, LA conference, I'm sorry, Las Vegas, Las Vegas Las conference. Vegas trade show, yeah. So 300,000. 
after sold 300,000, leverage that to get uh, your your house into a factory. Yeah. Right? Your yes. mom took out a mortgage, moved your friends in, that's when food would start pumping. Then after you leverage this, it, then you started putting it out in the community. Yes. Right? Getting the big guys, getting the store walls, you, you marketing. That was your marketing to, to grow it. Then you had more, more big moves and you got some big guys on board such as LL, mm -hmm. right? Then after LL, your company, is this the moment that it blew up? Is that when it did the 350 million per year? Meaning the community's buzzing from the walls to the, it, was it in stores already? It was in stores already? It was in stores already, but again, it, 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 it was in stores already, but again, you know, as we we're talking about, gonna talk about the book Power Shift, it was in stores in a different way, you know? A lot of kids would sell stuff to the stores, right? And mm -hmm. that's fine. But I used to go in and see, why does Timberland and Nike have these big displays? Well, I don't have money for displays, but it was in the hood, so what would I do? I would just run off a thousand posters and go in and poster the walls and make them, and not attack it, but make it look really cool like this area. And I would ask the store owners, let me put me over in that corner where it looks like crap. And so I would go to stores and do that, and that's why it started to build this little thing, you know, because I started separating myself a little bit from all the other brands who just sold them stuff. Oh, I see. So you went to these stores, and these got a bunch of stuff, right? But you yeah, try to stuff, highlight your brand. I try to highlight. I would, yeah. I would go in there, and I would just take these cheap posters, but I would just do these, these, these two walls, and put all the stuff in the corner, and then I was uh, separating myself from the other urban brands who just sold them and stuff. Yeah. So then your products highlighted. You're in stores. You got the street buzz going. Then you get LL, and then the gap blows up by thirty, spending that thirty million dollars on the ad, right? So this creates a lot of action for you, and then massive success in terms of $350 million a year in sales. And then I think the mistake that I heard you mention was that too much inventory and ran into the inventory challenges because the cycles change and it's so slow to, right, to get it again. Is that, what's, what's the main lesson kind of of, of that? Of well, that no, no, so too much inventory embarrassed different ways, mm -hmm. right? It was a mistake we made, we got cocky, mm -hmm. right? So what happens is when, you know, in our business at that time, when you know we would say, "All right, here's a box of jeans, and it's 12 pieces that come per box, and so you need to order two boxes, 10 boxes, 100 boxes, doesn't matter." But the store would say, "Listen, you know, um, the boxes have 232s, 234s, 236, 222, all the way up, right?" They were like, "We're in Mexico. They're not making people too big in Mexico, yeah, so yeah. we need just boxes with 32 and 34s." And we would say, "No, oh, mm. take the box like that," mm. and they would say, I, "But I don't want to take the box. Take the box like that. Or you're not getting food." Mm. You good? Mm -hmm. It's okay, we got these. Take the box like that, you're not getting fooled. Well, the store cannot not have fooled because then all of a sudden, yeah. somebody else is gonna get it and they look crazy. Yeah. So, what do they do? They took the fooled. But after two, three years, they would have massive inventory of 36, 38, 40, 42. Mm. So what are they gonna do now? I'm gonna put it over here in the corner for $20. Kid comes into the store now. They see FUBU jeans, $75. FUBU jeans piled up here, $20. There's no sign on it saying these are old styles mm. and um, that's why they're $20 and they're large. Mm. You uh, really, I mean, larger sizes. The kid mentally goes like this. Why the hell would I pay 75 if they're 20? And why is there so many damn jeans in here? Nobody's buying this shit anymore. Mm. Slowly corroded our brand. On the flip side, the other brands would say, I'll give you a, I mean, what, you want 32 and 34? That's all I'll sell you, no problem. Mm -hmm. You know? And so the, the ego came into place, or ignorance, but let's call it ignorance with ego, because I've got the golden rule. I'd already nurtured a great relationship with my consumers, and I mean, excuse me, I always built influence with my consumers, but my negotiation was horrible and harsh. Mm -hmm. And I didn't nurture the relationship after that, because I was like, screw you, I'm big time now. Mm -hmm ended up having a lot of inventory of FUBU. So what happens after that? You gotta go and dump it in Burlington and all those other stuff. So mm -hmm. you get just going to that store. I'm a mother, I'm out, and I'm looking, I'm in Macy's, and I'm in some of the better stores, and I'm looking at everything here, $100 from FUBU, and, uh, or I'm a kid and I see $100 from FUBU, $100 FUBU stuff, and my mother smacks me and goes, you idiot, we can get that at Burlington for $15. I got it. What am I gonna do? Mm. So, you know, these are lessons that we learn and we can share to people. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to act like every, I was a genius and everything was cool and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it happens. And mm -hmm. that taught me very valuable lessons for the future. Mm -hmm. Hi guys, this video is sponsored by Indochino, Postscript and Geology. Indochino will get you a great suit. 
Postscript will take care of SMS marketing for your e-commerce Shopify store, and Geology will take care of your skin. So the first sponsor, Indochino, this is a really, really awesome company to get a suit. Listen, people will determine what they think of you within seven seconds, seven seconds. That means how you look is really important. So Indochino, you can get a beautiful suit for yourself. The reason it's really special is because one, it's made to measure. You know how sometimes you get a suit and it'll be too long or something slightly off? and it messes up the whole suit look. With Indochino, it's made to measure. That means it's for you. That means it won't be just a suit, it's a suit perfectly measured for your body type. Number two reason it's awesome is because it's customizable. So with Indochino, you can customize the lapels, right? How wide do you want them? You can customize the buttons. Do you want two buttons? Do you want three buttons? Do you want double buttons? Some people even put a name on the inside, which I think is really cool. Uh, it's also very affordable. You can get a beautiful premium suit for just $359 and free shipping. And the fourth reason is if you don't know your measurements, let's say you don't know your measurements, you can uh, go to one of their many locations in the US or Canada and they'll measure you and send you your suit. So Indochino is an awesome company to get a suit. Click the link below, that way you can actually get it. And the second sponsor of this video is Postscript.io. This is a really, really awesome company for text messaging. So email has lower deliverability, hard to reach customers. Social is very expensive, but you can use Postscript.io for SMS marketing for your e-commerce Shopify store. So some of the reasons it's awesome, and before I say why it's awesome, listen to these stats that they gave me. One, 95% open rates. That means when you text your customers, 95% of your customers will open your text message. Two, 35% click-through rates. Imagine if you had 35% click-through rates, you'll get so many more sales. And 26x ROI of the users who use Postscript. These are phenomenal stats. Some of the features that make Postscript really special is one, they'll help you capture the phone number, right? So first, you need to even get the phone number of the user to text message them. With Postscript, they'll help you capture it, such as give you pop-ups, such as give you landing pages, such as give you email options and links so you can capture the customer's phone number. Two, they help you automate your text messaging. So if a customer put the items in the cart, but then abandon the cart, you can send them an automatic text message welcome messages. So let's say a customer just purchased from you, you can trigger an automatic SMS message that'll say, hey, welcome to uh, our family. Thanks for shopping with us. Or even cross sales. Let's say if a customer purchased a certain product with Postscript, you can trigger an automated SMS to try to cross sell that customer. You can also send targeted SMS campaigns. With Postscript, you can, you can identify which leads are most likely to convert. And then you can send them very custom messages. You can even include images photos and GIFs. I think that's really awesome because then you can, it's almost like a conversation. Uh, and you can also have one-on-one -on -one conversations. So customers can text you and you can text them back. That's phenomenal. So I highly recommend try postscript.io. Click the link below and you'll be able to get a 30-day free trial. 30-day free trial if you have an e-commerce store on Shopify. This is a great solution for SMS marketing. And the third sponsor of this video is Geology. Now, geology is really, really awesome because they take care of your skin. You know, we never know what products we should get to take care of our skin. I, I certainly don't know. I don't know what products are good for me. Um, and on geology, they take all of this away. So you do a, just a 30 second online quiz. 30 seconds, I did it myself. Uh, and it takes 30 seconds and then they will recommend the exact products that you should get the exact products for your skin. I think that's really, really awesome. Um, and for example, what you'll get in your kit, you'll get two face washes. So that way you have one in the bedroom, you can have one, I'm sorry, one in the bathroom and one in the, in the shower. You'll get a, a morning face cream that also even has SPF 10. So this way you can be, uh, you know, more safe from the sun. Night cream to take care of your face while you're sleeping. And this is one that I really think is, is amazing. It's the Geology uh, eye cream. And the reason this is so special is because many of us have uh, bags under our eyes or wrinkles and this cream, this, their night cream is specifically to either remove the dark circles or to remove the wrinkles. And I think that's really awesome. You can sign up through my link below for Geology and get your own packet of these things, two face washes, the morning cream, the night cream and the eye care, right? To take care of the wrinkles for just $30. Click the link below and the code is START30. Click the link and you will get your own set for just $30 and I think that's phenomenal. And thank you guys for sponsoring this video. So now the book. I saw you, you released a lot of books. You released five books. This is my fifth book, Fifth yes. book. 
not bad for a dyslexic uh, kid who, uh, who got left back. <laughs> Five, but you even had an album, visualized album. I had a visualized album. album, motivational. I'm yeah. not singing and dancing. I'm not. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to insult the true artists out there. I'm just doing my motivational speeches yeah. and somebody scored it. Which is cool, dude, because that stuff's so great for working out. Right, as you're running, as you're pushing, that's what that's what you actually I listen to. I listen to motivational stuff when I'm running, right? Five that's miles. exactly why I did it, because if you hear my speech once, you've heard it a million times, but just like when you hear Martin Luther King's speech on yeah. MLK Day and, and the DJ yeah. puts a beat underneath it, you go, yeah. wait a minute, I want to I wanna run to that. Yeah, so yeah. this this Power Shift book, what is... Uh, What's it about? What are the main things you're trying to convey from this book? So this is my fifth book, and what I do on each one of my books is I compile all the most commonly asked questions that I've had mm -hmm. out in the market because yeah. I can't be everywhere to everybody. Uh, and, um, and then I answer them all in a book, and then when I find that I've been asked a lot more questions in a different category, then I sit there and put them together. Now, um, my last two, one was power broke. You don't need money to make money. Then people want to know how do you spend and maximize your time. Rise and grind. Here's how. What's the difference between the 24 hours you're given in a day and my 24 hours? Mm -hmm. Why are you more successful than me or me more successful than him or her or she, yeah. whatever the case is, right? The most commonly asked thing I found after answering all those questions was how to negotiate something. And, and the reality is most of us in this world, we only have what we have because of our ability to negotiate. Mm. has nothing else to do with anything else. I'm trying to teach, so, so it's the three things that I'm kind of getting from the book. Now, no, the book's not out yet. The book's gonna be out in March. Right now they yes. can pre-order it. Correct. Uh, the three things, you're trying to teach them how to negotiate, and negotiating is everything. Well, no, influence first. Influence. Influence first. Influence, then negotiate. Then negotiate. Body language. Within right. the, within within the, the, within the aspect, uh, aspect of negotiate, and then nurture the relationship. But got the it. most important negotiation you're going to have is with yourself first. Mm. That's the most, because when you, when, you, when you have already said that you weren't worth this, mm. then you're not going to get it. Yeah, for sure. That's the most important negotiation to have. And what's your why? A lot of people, they, they, it's not that they uh, are not getting what they want, they don't ask the right questions. Mm. And they don't say to themselves, what's my end goal here actually? Yeah, for sure they don't. Remember, you remember like I'm talking about going into Walmart. Mm. Well, why are you going to Walmart? Yeah. Yeah. It's an ego thing. There's no problem. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I really, really agree with you, I think it was your uh, Power of Broke book. Uh, I really agree that I think founders just don't focus on having lack of resources enough, right? Like, it, it's all really about two things, right? It's all really about sales and your margin. That's it. Yeah. If you just make those two things go up, you're a success, right? I think all that other stuff is confusion, right? S your sales and your margin with the least possible out with the least possible spend. A and Correct. You're, you're you're teaching them that, and it's like another thing that frustrates me these days is founders now are proud frequently about how many employees they have. Dude, I got a f I got three hundred employees, but he's only doing like two million dollars a year in sales, right? The, the point is like the power of broke is like how do you do the most with the least? Yeah, and I, and I want to be honest, like, I was only able to write that after I was broke, and I did it, but then when I had money, and I thought that I could answer the pro, I, I did exactly what you're saying the founders, the mistake the founders made, because I had money, I thought, okay, now that I'm here, yeah, yeah. W let me do that, mm -hmm. but that's exactly, that's exactly what it is, and, but you know, that's, I don't want to be too hard on founders because we're all A type personalities yeah. and we just don't know how to stop, right? So how do you stop? You know what I'm saying? It's like how do, how do you make how do you take that DNA out of them? You know, at a certain point. So that's why I share these lessons to say I've been through this, right? Yeah. And and you're gonna go through this, and we're gonna make some mistakes. I have had to recalibrate what I did and say, you know what? Why this fail? Because every single thing that I have failed at in the past, I did this time, mm. or Everything, the thing I succeeded at. I'll give you an example. I, every single time that I have succeeded, there's been three things in play. Number one, I absolutely loved what I was doing. Mm. I loved it. Clothing, writing books, motivational speaking, being on Shark Tank, and whatever the case is. Number two, because I loved what, because I loved that I did my homework. It was every day I was learning something new and I kept learning how to make better clothing, kept learning how to find licenses, get expansion, kept learning who the hardest artists were, kept learning new fabrics, materials, yeah. finding out stuff like Kooji, who can I acquire, Kooji and Kappa and all these other brands. Uh, and uh, you know, and number three, 
if I didn't do my homework and uh, you know I was what I love what I did, I, I love partnered love. up with somebody great, a strategic partner, an acquisition like you're saying, or a great management. Mm. Every single time I failed, the one thing was missing. From these, love, learning, or partners, right? One thing was missing. Mm. I didn't love it. So if I didn't love it, guess what happened? Why the hell would I do homework on some shit that I don't like? Yeah. If I didn't do homework on some shit that I didn't like, then I probably would hire somebody that I never did my homework on. Mm. And whether they were doing good, bad, or indifferent, I wouldn't know any better because I didn't give a shit. Yeah. It failed. See, uh, three simple things. I'm a simple guy. Yeah. How can this? How can we win at this, Damon? So many of us hire employees when we haven't done that job. Are you saying that we should kind of still dig in and learn how to do this thing before hiring that expert? I'm learning TikTok. I'm 50 years old. Why should I be learning TikTok right now? Mm -hmm. Do you think that I'm going to be dancing around with a chicken? Mm -hmm. But I need to learn the fundamentals and the basics of it so that I'm not the sucker at the poker table. I understand. Right? And there's going to be 10 other TikToks in between now and the next 10 years. But that TikTok kid who's 15 years old, they're going to be one of the top consumers in the world in 10 years at 25 years old. And if I don't learn the fundamentals of it now, then how am I going to know if you're selling me, if you work in my social media department or we should expand here? How am I going to know if you are good? What if you decide to leave me? You're going to take the keys to the car and I don't know how to, right. I don't know how to handle it? You got to keep learning. You have to keep learning. Listen, I learn. You know, I, I love putting out something on some on my Instagram sometimes of what I learned today. I learn every single day. Yeah. You know, what I learned yesterday that seventy percent of the Gen Z cons Gen Z consumers or Gen Z Gen, Gen Z generation and consumers yeah. they don't want to have credit. They don't want to have credit cards. They don't want to have a lot of things because they they grew up when they were eight or ten or maybe fifteen years old. Mm. They watched their 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 parents lose their homes yeah. and the various other things because they were eight years old. I mean, oh eight came around, right? So they have a perception that financial institutions may be not as great as they like. So they are dealing with the good financial institutions in different ways. They like to pay down everything, or they like various different things. So if I learn that and I know that that consumer could be anywhere from 15 to 30 years old, how am I learning other uh, financial tools to be able to make a transaction and or a convertible uh, sale to them easier? Where are they looking? You know what I mean? You've got to learn every single day in every single area. You don't have to learn everything, but it has to start somewhere. Yeah, a great hack that I have for learning is uh, I listen to audio books on 2.5x the speed. <laughs> and I do when I run, right? When I exercise, so it's like when I exercise in the morning for an hour and a half, I've covered like 40% of an audiobook, and that really helped me. This is one hack really helped me big time. I can't believe I wasn't doing it before, uh, which is 2.5x speed uh, of my books. And they're all nonfiction books. Uh, so, so, so what I used to do, and unfortunately, I am uh, married now to a woman who I cannot play anything when she's sleeping, but I'm on the road so much, mm. is I play my audiobooks before I, when I'm sleeping at a very, very low rate because your subconscious mind can't filter out what's real or not. Super interesting. And if it's just playing there in the middle of the night at a very, very low, low weight, you're picking up a lot of things in, in the book. And yeah. your thinking is falling you to sleep. It's putting you to sleep, but it's absorbing a lot of the information. Fascinating. You're listening to 1x, very slow. 1x the speed, you're slowing it down way up and sleeping No, 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 it. no. In the volume wise, I'm, I'm playing it. the same way, but I'm playing it super, super uh, low because now I wake up and I a lot of times my mind has already absorbed some of the information mm -hmm. and I'll play the same book you know for two weeks and I'll probably hear the whole book you know but I didn't know how I absorbed that information very interesting dude no one's ever actually mentioned this as you're sleeping you plug up with an audio book very I'll quiet put it, and I'll put it on a little speaker mm. oh, oh, you're really not low. plugging up you have to play in the room yeah yeah mm -hmm. interesting dude I also saw something that you mentioned that was uh, how you set your goals. Now, what I saw was you have your seven goals for now, six months. Six. Six. <laughs> then you have your five-year goal and a 20-year goal. But what was interesting is what you're thinking about when you're reading it. Can you kind of elaborate on this? Because you were mentioning like you were thinking, how am I going to get it? Or like, can you elaborate on your goal setting process? Yeah, so I learned this from Napoleon Hill, <coughs> Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. Um, and obviously many of the people here watching know the book. Uh, so I have 10 goals that I read every single night before I go to bed, and I read them every single morning when I wake up. Uh, six of them expire in six months, and the other four expire in two years, five years, 10 years, and 20 years. 
the ones that expire in six months, I set them super high. I never hit them. Mm. Meaning, I'm going to make this amount of money. Let's say I make this amount. But once the six months expire and I reset the goal, mm. I reset it for this amount. Yeah. Right? The reason I read them before I go to bed is just like listening to the audio book is that science has pro proven that over 75% of what you dream about is things that you either fear or things that you hope will happen to you. Mm. And so I want to program my mind with the last thing of that. Mm. Right? That's why I don't watch t TV before I go to sleep because I don't want to dream that Darth Vader is coming for me. All right? So when I wake up in the morning, the reason I read them is because I take one action closer to that goal, meaning a call. Let's say I, because uh, my goals range from faith to faith to family to whatever the case is to business, yeah. right? And what if one of those goals are to, uh, uh, you know, to to make a certain amount of money, so I'm, I need to go into this industry. Well, then if I make one call that morning on the way to work, because I keep reminding myself of that, after six months, that's 180 calls, right? Or whatever the case is, right? If it is to lose weight, to get down to a certain number, right? Uh, okay, so then I realize that every time I take that action, I'm gonna go to the store and pick up a green drink instead of that delicious croissant bacon and egg. Yeah, That's one, that's 500 calories less than I had that day and I oxidize my body, right? So that's why, but you, the talk, you were talking about the visualization part. When you start thinking about your goals, you have to meditate. And of course, if in two and five and 10 and 20 years, you have these goals, if in five years, your goal is to buy that house, that certain place, you don't just go, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna buy a 5,000 square foot house in this area. You don't do that. Mm. Is it colonial? Is it farm style? How does the door handle feel when you touch the door? Is it glass? Is it brass? Is it cold? Is it warm? When you open the door, do you smell the bread baking in the in the kitchen? Is it five o'clock and your significant other comes home and says, hey honey, how's work? Here's how my day is. Is it a winding staircase? Do the kids are out in the backyard playing with the dog? Mm. You have to visualize that. If you don't visualize it, then it's, it's less likely gonna happen. But remember, your subconscious mind cannot tell the difference when it filters things out. It's interesting, dude. Just to make sure I didn't miss anything. So. Let's say somebody, let's say one of our founders has a goal to hit a million dollars a month in sales. So the way you would do this is you would write, hit a million dollars a month in sales, right? And then you would read this twice in the morning, in the evening. No. And then what would you say? So, it, so it, would, it would say sales, yeah. one million dollars a month in sales. Then it would say, it would say um, increase outreach of calls by 2%, 10%, whatever the case is, or uh, you know, uh, this is your how. This is your how, right? This is a how, how you go down the method. Yeah. Right. So let me let me let me give you. Uh, yeah. In, in, by called by this, uh, spend two, or five, or ten hours a week on this uh, social media to move us from retail to social media. Yeah. And in return for the million dollars a month, because there has to be a return for it. Yeah. A lot of people go out in life and they say, "I want a million dollars." Mm. Right. So what are you gonna do with the million dollars? You got it. Mm. Gonna buy one car. You're going to buy 20. You're going to give it away. You're going to live off $50,000 a year for the next five years and travel the world and feed starving kids. Mm. But a lot of people don't know their why yeah, at the don't. end. So in regards to the million dollars, when we get up to this level of point, I'm going to either be able to cash out some of my uh, uh, partners, like you were saying earlier, or I'm going to put away money for the kids' college fund. And what that's going to do is that going to help this, this, that. So it's always what the target is, the action and the plan of action and map to get to it, and what is the payoff after getting to it. So by I'll payoff, you, you mean why? By payoff, you mean why? Is payoff, you, yeah. So how, I'll, give, I'll give you one of my real goals. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you the number, or yeah. maybe I will tell you the number. You know. Um, Get down to 173 pounds by a certain date. Mm. Okay, how am I gonna do that? I'm going to do cardio in the morning, one hour cardio in the morning and free weights at night. I'm going to walk 10,000 steps. I'm gonna substitute one meal with a uh, um, green drink. I'm not going to eat after 6 p.m. No meats, no chicken, no meat, no meat, no chicken, no fried foods. Mm. This will, in return, reduce my weight by four pounds per month. Micro and goals, micro. You, you're splitting that big one into the micro, right? 
Yeah. And when I get to this level, I will be in my daughter's lives longer to walk them down the aisle. I will be, uh, I will be more active. I will be healthier, and it will it will reduce my uh, my uh, vulnerability to sicknesses and cancer, which will allow me to stay longer yeah, uh, on this planet to be a better husband. That's a real goal of mine. Yeah, it's interesting. You're not even setting like a single action. You're putting all the actions that you're doing to achieve this goal. And are you, are you imagining yourself weighing 173? Are you visualizing it? I'm not imagining that. I'm envisioning me walking my daughter down the aisle. aisle. Yeah, I'm, I'm envisioning me and my wife just, you yeah. know, because I'm, I'm old. My wife is 15 years younger than me. Mm. So I'm envisioning me being around her life healthy, not in a wheelchair, not shitting on myself, shitting on myself in a diaper yeah. with no teeth. Mm. How would you, cause you've been through some hardships in your life, right? Like from uh, you cancer, dude, you overcame cancer, right? You had some hearing also you I'm sure you had many business challenges what are you thinking about to stay optimistic during many of these hard times my goals same goals Walk the goals the goals keep it's a compass Got it's it. a dashboard it keeps you going and listen I'm human sometimes I don't read the goals for five days or ten days and I mm -hmm. and and I forget I don't know I'll get to it tomorrow I'll get to it tomorrow and you know you never get to it tomorrow and then and then I'm sitting there and I'm like this why am I feeling so depressed wait a minute Hey, Mr. Genius, who tells everybody to read their damn goals, why don't you read your goals? Mm -hmm. I go back and read my goals, and it gets me back. You know, Will Smith said something that was similar to this. He was like, uh, we can't control what comes at us, but we certainly can control the way we respond to everything, right? It's like we can, whatever we have, whatever we have, whatever's there is there, but we control everything that we do with that information, right? Or Listen, let me tell you something. I'm, and I'm, again, I made some stupid ass mistakes you know, as a kid coming up, like we all did. Yeah. I had to live with them. Yeah. I wish I wish I went to college, mm -hmm. because I almost went bankrupt three times because I had no financial intelligence, but I was the stupid kid who said, oh, I got out of high school, I'm gonna take one year off before I went to college, and that one year became, you know, became the rest of my life. And I almost lost everything three separate times, mm -hmm. right, Be before I then started to learn that I needed financial intelligence. I could have sat back and said, well, I didn't go to college and nobody told me about money. Mm. Well, when are you going to learn? Yeah. Right? So, you know, it, the, book, the book is about, first of all, creating influence. It is about negotiating with yourself, with others. And then how do you nurture those relationships and, and, and get the most out of it? Just, just to touch on this, because you stress it a lot, the financial intelligence. By this, you just mean budgeting, right? You mean budgeting, probably budgeting all your spends, right? Don't be surprised with something like you mentioned. You know, no, you no, no. I mean, I mean, knowing about how money and dollars and everything works. You got to remember, you know, uh, the old guard, not the new necessarily. But the only thing you're not going to learn from generally school is financial intelligence, mm -hmm. because there's no reason for a school to teach you financial intelligence. Because you need to be able to take out three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars worth of loans when you get to this point. <laughs> yeah, so you. how would I teach you to not be my customer? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, right. So so you're not going to learn financial intelligence there. Yeah, right. And financial intelligence is always about constantly understanding how things work. Right. I was told. I was told. Let me tell you one of my other stupid mistakes. I was told, you know, jewelry retains value. Mm. Jewelry does not retain value. Yeah. Stones retain value. So if you buried a diamond in 1975 that you paid $100,000 for, you buried a diamond in the ground. Put it in the safe. Yeah. Well, let's not bury it in the ground. Diamond, $100,000, 1975, you put it in the safe. $100,000 in cash, you put it in the safe. Today, you open up both of them. The $100,000 can barely get you a Mercedes. The diamond is worth $2.5 million today. That is a stone. Now here's my understanding of financial tell when I first made money. I'm gonna buy a three hundred thousand dollar crusted out Fat Albert medallion. Got it. It's jewelry. Of course it's gonna go up. So when I went to go sell it, because I didn't need it anymore, I'll give you fifty thousand dollars for the broken up diamonds in mm -hmm. it, because you're an idiot. Nobody else wants a three or four hundred thousand dollar fat Albert yeah. crusted out medallion. Yeah, I understand. Financial intelligence is learning how money works. And the last question. The last question is, uh, as we wrap this up, if you could communicate one message to all of entrepreneurs, aside for Get the Power Shift book, <laughs> what would you communicate to them? One message to all of entrepreneurs, what would you want them to know? 
the being an entrepreneur is not easy um, and I understand your pain I understand that you everybody thinks you walk on water and they all tell you your problems or they all tell you their problems your employees and everybody else and you can't tell them your problems yeah. about your financial stress the fact that if you don't get this account you may have to close the business in six months because if you tell your best employees I'm gonna have to close the business in six months if I don't get this account don't they're gonna get a job right away yeah your family life is stressed and strained because again you're trying to do the best you can to be able to do your part of the job of the family and mental health is a really big issue in the uh, entrepreneurship community and it's all right talk to people about it you know you're on the road heavy with it and you know every time you know you you thought that you was going to be easy but you're the first person in the office you're the last to leave you thank everybody for your success and blame only one person for your failure i love that yeah. <laughs> you thank reality. everybody for your success but blame only one person for your failure that's what it is right um and uh you know listen Lori likes to say you become an entrepreneur to work 80 hours so you don't have to work 40 hours mm -hmm. Uh, but you're in charge of your own destiny. And if you look at Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain and unfortunately what happened to them, it shows that it is, uh, it is not easy. So don't let all these people fool you how glamorous it is. It's not mm -hmm. yet. If you're doing something that's fulfilling, you're challenging yourself and you love what you do, do it. But get help, talk to people that you trust, that you love uh, if you're an entrepreneur and uh, and just be honest with people. You know, people love to root for you. If yeah. you always act like, you know, everything's okay, well, then nobody's going to root for you. Yeah. If you're always winning, but show them, show them there, be authentic. You're saying be authentic. You know, yeah, be what's, you. What's, what's wrong with being authentic, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, um, that's what I find. Yeah. Um, and, you know, th that's it. I mean, you know, and, 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 and also the last point, take care of your health. Mm. Entrepreneurs take care of everybody else except for themselves. Yeah. They're always loaning this person this, giving that person the day or trying to solve this problem, whatever. Yeah. But take care of yourself because you, w what's going to happen if, if you're not here? Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode. Again, thanks Dam Damon John for stopping by and sharing all of this mm. <laughs> startup advice. Get us book, Power Shift. It comes out in March. Power Shift. If you ever want to contact me, I'm Damon at DamonJohn.com. So you can contact me there and just follow me on social media. Mm. Yeah, make sure to check out his Instagram. There's a lot of many, many videos. He posts a lot of videos. Yeah. Um, and make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss any more exciting, epic interviews with the world's best founders. Damon, thanks so much for stopping by, man. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you.